Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. Today we are going to get back to our roots and give you the new and improved edition of our N plus A equals J theory. Our original series on the topic contained the very first videos we ever made, and it has been brought to our attention that we are best known for this theory. And after about a year of making videos, we have improved a bit with regards to actually making videos. And through a combination of constantly researching the text to make weekly videos and the introduction of the annotated iBooks, we have come across new information on the topic that we would like to share with you. This new information will be woven into our original theory and presented in chronological order as a means of further reinforcing the fact that Jon Snow is Ned Stark and Ashara Dane's son, and the true heir to Winterfell. So, let's do this. Now, before we get this party started, we wanted to first clarify for everybody who's watching this video that we are not talking about the once greatest show that ever was or will be. We are talking about the books. And no, the books and the show are not the same thing anymore. So please do not flood our comment section with comments about what the show is doing, because the two have almost nothing to do with each other at this point. George R. R. Martin called the show licensed fan fiction, and David Benioff said the show is so different than the books that book readers will be shocked. So please, do not waste your time or ours lecturing us about what the show is doing. So let's get straight to it. R plus L equals J is a flimsy book theory at best. It basically combines Promise Me Ned from A Bed of Blood and Ned's an Honorable Guy and is usually accompanied by two or three quotes from the books that could be used to support it if you ignore the context of where it came from, and then concludes that obviously Rhaegar plus Lyanna equals John. George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire is far too complex for that. In fact, when his wife was asked about R plus L equals J at a party in 2002, she actually laughed in the person's face and said that is too simple for George. These books are painstakingly detailed, to the point where even if you were to read them a dozen times, you'd probably still miss the significance of two-thirds of the information provided, as figuring it out requires that you connect dots that are often thousands of pages apart. Now, the reason I think this theory really took off is twofold. First of all, for a decade and a half, there was no plausible alternatives to John as to who could be Rhaegar and Lyanna's child. And as such, it became thought of as virtually bulletproof. But then, A Dance with Dragons came out, and we meet a character that fits the bill much better than John does. Those of us who read the books post-2011 got to read all five of them in quick succession, and most likely have a slightly different view of the story than those of you who started reading the books in 1996. As for us, there was no waiting involved when we went through them, which obviously makes it easier to remember little details throughout the story. On top of that, we had resources available to us that weren't around when the books first came out, such as the app in the World of Ice and Fire, which brings us to the second reason we think this theory became as popular as it is. People didn't have the resources available to them to understand the timeline surrounding Jon Snow's birth. With the release of The World of Ice and Fire, the app, annotated iBooks, and all of the additional information that's provided in them, calculating when key events took place during this time period is now possible, where it wasn't previously, which allowed for a lot of false information to circulate for so long that millions of people now think they're facts. This made it possible for people to incorrectly determine that there wasn't enough time for Ned and Ashara to develop a serious relationship, because after Harrenhal, they think that Robert's Rebellion just almost immediately broke out, and in such a time of madness, 
when would Ned have had time to be falling in love with Ashara? After all, he was busy fighting and winning a war. However, once you figure out the timeline, you realize that there's a heck of a lot more time that passes between these events than most people think. Additionally, understanding the timeline of events during this time period makes it abundantly clear that no child conceived at Harrenhal could have been born during Robert's Rebellion. So, we're now going to quickly identify three key events and when they took place, which we think will paint a very vivid picture of the sequence of events in the few years leading up to Jon Snow's birth. The first is the tourney at Harrenhal. In the World of Ice and Fire, The Fall of the Dragons, it says that the tourney took place in the year of the False Spring. It also tells you that the False Spring lasted about two months, and that it started snowing again in King's Landing on the last day of the year 281. That essentially means that, using our calendar, the False Spring took place in November and December of the year 281. And since we know the tourney took place during the False Spring, the tourney was held sometime during the last two months of 281. The next identifiable plot point is Brendan Stark and Littlefinger's duel for Catelyn. According to both Catelyn and the app, Littlefinger was 15 years old when he dueled Brandon, and Catelyn notes that he was still shy of 30 when she first sees him in King's Landing in A Game of Thrones, which is pretty well established to have taken place in the year 298. So, if he's still 29 years old when Catelyn sees him in 298, and he was 15 years old when they fought the duel, that leaves only the years 283 and 284 as possible years that the duel took place. Now, there are a multitude of reasons why the year 284 needs to be eliminated, and I don't really think that we need to waste our time going over it here. So that only leaves one viable option as to when the duel took place. 283, most likely pretty early in the year. Why is this important to note? Well, Brendan Stark was obviously still alive when he dueled Littlefinger, and their duel took place prior to the start of Robert's Rebellion, which means over a year went by between the tourney at Harrenhal and the start of Robert's Rebellion, which really does make sense, because the tourney happened during the fall spring, and then winter came back for an unknown period of time before the actual spring came. When the actual spring came was when the marriage was announced that prompted Littlefinger to get so drunk that he ended up sleeping with Liza and still to this day believes that it was Catelyn. And then he got it in his head that he should challenge Brandon Stark for her hand. However, Brandon didn't immediately ride to Riverrun to fight him. As Ned explains to Littlefinger in his very first small council meeting that Brandon had spoken about Littlefinger, quote, often and with some heat. This would indicate that some time had passed between Littlefinger's challenge and Brandon's trip south, because in order for him to speak about it often, it would require that he brings it up several times. Brandon likely wasn't in the mood to make a special trip to River Run to deal with the likes of Littlefinger, as it would require him to travel, I don't know, about a month or so in each direction, so he probably decided that he would just arrive at River Run earlier than the rest of the Starks so he could take care of his duel prior to the wedding guests arriving. The next identifiable plot point is Viserys fleeing King's Landing in the wake of Rhaegar's defeat at the Trident. In A Game of Thrones, Daenerys won. Danny tells us that Viserys was eight years old when he and his newly pregnant mother fled King's Landing and went to Dragonstone. The World of Ice and Fire tells us that Viserys was born in the year 276. Well, a child born in the year 276 cannot turn 8 until the year 284. So, using that timeline, you can sort of establish approximately when the events that kind of drive the mystery behind Jon Snow's birth took place. Now that we've established that, it is time to present what we know took place between these key events then draw on this information to try to fill in the gaps. So, let's start with what we know about Harrenhal. According to the Night of the Laughing Tree story told by Mira, Ned and Ashara met and danced at Harrenhal. 
This is backed up by Ned Dane telling Arya that Ashara and Ned met and fell in love at Harrenhal. We also know that Rhaegar won the joust, and for some reason decided to walk right past his third trimester pregnant wife and crown Lyanna the Queen of Love and Beauty, which, as you might imagine, didn't particularly sit well with several notable characters. So, it would appear that two romances involving Starks began at Harrenhal. But where did everyone go after the tourney? Well, it is never explicitly stated that Rhaegar and Elia immediately returned to Dragonstone following the tourney, but it seems almost impossible that they didn't, because Elia gave birth to their son Aegon on Dragonstone before the new year, and the fall spring was the last two months of that year. Birthing Aegon nearly killed her, and shortly thereafter, the maester on hand informed Rhaegar that Elia would be unable to bear him any more children. And right after the new year, Rhaegar and his companions left Dragonstone, and no one seems to know where they went. Only that he showed up in King's Landing to lead the Targaryen forces north to the Trident at the end of Robert's Rebellion. Elia, on the other hand, stayed on Dragonstone to recover until she was summoned to King's Landing by Eris after the rebellion started as an insurance policy of sorts, because he feared the Dornish would turn on them, and he wanted Elia and her children as hostages to ensure that they didn't. During this prolonged stay on Dragonstone, following Harrenhal and the birth of her son, it is almost certain that Elia's lady companions, such as Ashara Dane, would have been with her. In fact, George R. R. Martin's own words further support the claim that Ashara spent at least some time at Dragonstone with Elia following the tourney. In response to a fan letter, George R. R. Martin indicated that Ashara was a lady companion to Elia during the first few years of her marriage to Rhaegar. We know Rhaegar and Elia were wed in 280. Therefore, in order for Ashara to serve for a quote, few years, then we know she had to have continued serving Elia for at least some time following the tourney, which took place in 281. Given the European-inspired feudal customs and traditions within the story, it is likely that if Ashara were to leave her role as a lady companion to the princess, there would have to be a reason. As a general rule, it seems like there would be three ways to be released from such a role. The first would be courtship and marriage. The second would be some sort of complicated resignation that would likely require a good reason and both the royal family and her family's consent. And the third is getting dismissed. Both the second and third options seem very unlikely, as either would have been accompanied by gossip and or juicy rumors, and there are none. According to Ned Dane, Ned and Ashara met and fell in love at Harrenhal. Following the tourney, it seems almost certain Ashara returned to Dragonstone with Elia. We also know that Ned spent a considerable amount of time in the Vale, even after his fostering. Gulltown and Dragonstone are pretty close, and these two are young and in love. Ned is a second son, and is therefore relatively free to pursue a love match, should his father approve of his choice. And the only thing standing between Ashara and seeing Ned would be Elia, who by all accounts was a nice girl, who would probably have been happy for her friend. So, in going on Ned Dane's claim that Ned and Ashara fell in love at Harrenhal, plus the fact that there was nothing standing in the way of them seeing one another, there is virtually no way that they never saw each other again after the tourney. We also know that Ashara wasn't with Elia when King's Landing was sacked which means she left her position prior to Elia going to King's Landing after the rebellion began. So when did she leave? We think prior to Brandon Stark and Catelyn Tully's wedding seems to fit the bill. This would be an event of great pomp and circumstance, as it is the joining of two of the most powerful houses in Westeros, and would therefore have a very impressive guest list which would give Ned the opportunity to invite Ashara so he could present her to his father and receive his blessing to marry her. So, she meets him in Gulltown so they can travel together to the wedding, likely planning on meeting the rest of the Stark party at the crossing, but either on their way there or once they arrive, 
They hear of Lyanna's abduction, and that Brandon left in a fury and was headed for King's Landing. In a circumstance such as this, Ned would have taken Ashara under his protection as they traveled to the wedding, and he's not exactly a dummy, and would have very quickly realized that this situation could take a drastic turn for the worse, and they should turn back towards the Vale, where he would have been almost positive that they would be safe. By the time they got to the Vale, word of his brother and father's arrests and executions would have likely reached their ear, and John Aaron would be calling his banners. Gulltown, as well as a few other Vale lords, remained loyal to the Targaryens, so rather than risking the easier route, they went through the Mountains of the Moon to the Fingers, which is anywhere between 470 and 570 miles of very slow mountain travel, where they found a fisherman to take them across the Bight to White Harbor. They ended up getting caught in a storm, and washed ashore in Sisterton, where they told the locals that she was the fisherman's daughter, because this is wartime, and the people of the Three Sisters are an unsavory type, and Ned would not have trusted them to know that she would be a valuable hostage. While they were there, the locals clearly noticed something about the two of them, because they all believe that this girl that Ned was with is John's mother. Think about it. Ned was in an absolute perfect storm. His father and brother are dead, his sister has been abducted, and he is trying to get home to call the banners to head off to war. When you combine that with nearly drowning, would it be surprising that the stress of this situation drove him into Ashara, the woman he loves and wants to marry's arms? No, it would be human, which Ned absolutely is. And what would Ned do if he slept with a highborn maid? More likely than not, he would do the same thing his son Rob did when faced with a similar situation. He'd marry her. Which just so happens to be Tywin Lannister's opinion as well. Which is why he arranged for Rob to find himself in that position, because he was counting on him to be, quote, his father's son, and place her honor above his own, and marry her, thus driving a wedge into his army. So, George provided an annotation that tells us that Winterfell is 800 miles from Castle Black. If you use that information to create a scale and combine it with his annotation about how fast people are capable of traveling in the story, you can start to map out approximately when everything took place over the course of Robert's Rebellion. The official start of Robert's Rebellion was when John Aaron called his banners in defense of Ned and Robert and it is said that it lasted a year. Assuming Ned was somewhere in the general vicinity of the Bloody Gate at this time, his route to White Harbor covered anywhere between 14 and 1,500 miles, and depending on the route Ned chose, the first 470 to 570 of them were his, quote, treacherous trip through the Mountains of the Moon to the Fingers. From that, it seems pretty obvious that Ned wasn't breaking any land speed records here. George said that on Valyrian dragon roads, which are far better than anything in Westeros, foot soldiers would be capable of traveling about 25 miles a day, and mounted cavalry 37.5 to 50 miles a day. This clearly indicates that traveling in Westeros is slower than that. When you account for the need to go over and around mountains, it would obviously be a lot slower than that, even if they had proper mounts for the terrain. There would be days where travel was relatively swift, but there would also be days where they only managed to go a few miles. Let's be generous and say that because of the urgency of the situation, they averaged 18 miles a day. That would mean this part of the trip lasted anywhere between 26 and 31 days, and they're still in the veil. Then, they got on a fishing boat, which we learned from Catelyn are pretty darn slow, as she said that if they had taken a fishing boat to King's Landing, they'd still be rounding the fingers instead of arriving in King's Landing. Now, Catelyn's trip took approximately a month. Therefore, taking a fishing boat about halfway there and getting caught in a storm and washing ashore in Sweet Sister would take about 15 days, adding one to account for the storm bringing us to 41 to 46 days into the war. From Sweet Sister to White Harbor 
is another 420 miles, presumably on a far better boat this time. So let's say it took them four days to get to White Harbor. We're now 45 to 50 days into Robert's Rebellion, and Ned has finally arrived in the north. From White Harbor, he now needs to travel the 530 miles from there to Winterfell, either going against the current on a boat or on a horse. Let's say that he's really in a hurry and manages to travel over 50 miles a day. That's another 10 days, bringing us to 55 to 60 days into the war when Ned arrives in Winterfell. Let's backtrack a bit and once again be very generous and say that it is possible for Ned to call the banners from White Harbor and everyone will still show up even though there's no Stark seal on the letters they're receiving. White Harbor is 900 miles as the Raven flies from Carhold, and Carhold is 780 miles from Winterfell. A Raven can fly about 100 miles a day, so the Karstarks get the message nine days later, and let's say it takes them three days to get all their men together. Now, they still have a 39-day march to Winterfell. So, if you add 51 days to when Ned first arrived in White Harbor, you're now at 96 to 101 days into the rebellion when Ned's bannermen have now arrived in Winterfell and can begin marching south. They met up with John Aaron at the crossroads, which is 1,650 miles from Winterfell. That's an 83-day march for the infantry, bringing us to 179 to 184 days into the war. From there, they have a 470-mile march to River Run which would take the infantry another 23, maybe 24 days if you include having to cross the river. And Ned and John Aaron would have likely stayed within a couple days of the bulk of their army, which would bring us to about 200 days into the war when Ned and John Aaron first showed up in River Run to seek the support of the Riverlands. Here, they negotiated with Hoster Tully, gained their support, and went to go save Robert at Stony Sept which would take another 8 days for the cavalry and 15 for the infantry. And since time is of the essence, let's just say that Ned arrived at Stony Sept 208 days into the war. Now, we realize a lot of you are thinking we're out of our minds to think that it all took this long. But we used the same method to track Robert's movements through the early stages of the war and calculated his arrival at Stony Sept at 200 to 205 days into the rebellion. In other words, regardless of how you work it out, whether it be from Ned's side of the equation or Robert's, they line up perfectly. With Ned arriving at Stony Sept to save Robert three to eight days after Robert's wounds forced him to stop there to rest. That would mean that Ned didn't marry Catelyn until about seven months into the war. It also tells us that about four and a half months passed between their marriage and the Battle of the Trident. Which makes sense, because following John Connington's defeat at Stony Sept, he was exiled, and Gerald Hightower was sent to go find Rhaegar and bring him to King's Landing, while Eris was building an army. There aren't any significant events listed between Ned's marriage to Catelyn and the Battle of the Trident, which suggests there was a bit of a standoff going on, similar to when Tywin was sitting at Harrenhal and Rob at Riverrun, each waiting to see what the other would do next. In this case, nothing was happening because there was no one for Robert, Ned, John Aaron, and Hoster Tully to fight. The Dornish had yet to send their spears north, Tywin Lannister was sitting tight at Casterly Rock, and the Tyrells settled in to besiege Storm's End right around the same time that the battle at Stony Sept was going on. So they win at the Trident, Robert is wounded, and he sends Ned to take King's Landing in his stead. Tywin Lannister managed to beat Ned there, however, and was sacking the city and disposing of any and all remaining Targaryens as a means of demonstrating House Lannister's loyalty to the new king. Speaking of the sack of King's Landing, the new iBook version of the series contains an annotation that confirms that John was born, quote, sometime around or shortly after the sack of King's Landing. The significance of this annotation cannot be understated. A. It absolutely, 100%, eliminates the possibility that John is Rhaegar and Lyanna's, as that places Ned 
in or around King's Landing, which would put him, I don't know, anywhere between 1,500 and 2,000 miles from where his sister was giving birth. B. According to George, Danny is eight or nine months younger than John, and was therefore conceived right around this point in the story, which is after Rhaegar was already dead, and definitely well over a month after he had left Lyanna. So she is also mathematically eliminated as a possible child of Rhaegar and Lyanna. And C. John would have to be conceived nine months prior to the sack, which brings us back to where Ned was 90 days into the war. The North. This circles us back to Ned being driven into the arms of his beloved Ashara Dane by the stress of an almost incomprehensible combination of his father and brother's deaths, his sister's abduction, nearly drowning, and knowing that he's about to go to war. So, Ned gets to White Harbor and marries Ashara because he had been sleeping with her, which would make it the right thing to do, and on top of that, he wants to marry her. But where was Ned prior to him leading the northern forces south? Well, it isn't really ever said. He didn't necessarily have to leave White Harbor and go to Winterfell immediately, or if he did, it doesn't mean that he had to stay there the whole time. After all, as we previously showed, from the moment the Raven left White Harbor en route to Carhold, Ned would have had seven weeks until he could expect the Karstark foot soldiers to arrive in Winterfell. That would leave a very real possibility that he could have either gone to Winterfell, gave orders to his top guys, and taken a maybe four-day boat trip back down the river to White Harbor, and stayed at the Wolsten with his new wife and love of his life for a few weeks before heading back to Winterfell to lead the army south. That not only makes it logical from a human perspective, but mathematically possible that Jon Snow was conceived at the Wolf's Den about 90 days into the war. It would also give it a bit of a poetic touch, as the Wolf's Den was built by a king in the north named Jon Stark, and Jon would have been conceived there. It would also mean that Jon is a Stark by right, not because of Rob's royal decree that named him his heir and was, and is, the rightful heir to Winterfell, and the likely future King of the North. Mm -hmm.